The events of that day were to lead to one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake by Stephen Hand. Chapter 12 The features were distorted. Kemper's head was much narrower than the killer's, so the face had been softened and stretched to fit. But there was no mistaking it. Aaron could even see the remnants of the goatee. Oh my god! Kemper was dead. Her boyfriend, her lover, the father of her unborn child, her husband-to-be dead. And now that bastard, that fucking animal bastard, was wearing her lover's remains. He had abused Kemper's body. He'd handled it, touched it, and dismembered it. The body that had felt warm and tender. The body Aaron had made love to was now a slab of lifeless cut meat. Her baby's daddy had become a whole new wardrobe for that death-breathing bastard. If she could, she'd kill him right now. No guilt, no remorse, just pure revenge. Aaron felt the urge, the need to slaughter. Out front, Leatherface looked at her from within the white light of the headlights and leered, mentally slicing her from within Kemper's lifeless face. Her boyfriend would be the last thing she saw before she died. Thick with the juicy puree of Pepper's corpse, the chainsaw fired up and lurched like a heaving spastic reflex towards the windshield. Aaron yelped and almost fell out through the van door. If only she had the strength to beat the bastard. Because that's all he had. It was sheer brute force that gave him power over her. Not authority, justice, superior intelligence or wisdom, moral right, not even cash, just raw fucking power. She could have been the president and she'd still be screaming in fear for her life. Violence is a great leveler. In the face of a brutal beating, all men are equal. Yet despite this, despite the raging panic that had haunted her for most of the day, Aaron was surprised by just how much she was able to deal with. She had no choice but to accept the depraved psychopathic nature of her attacker. She could almost hold back the deep revulsion she felt at the mere sight of him, and at this need that he had to butcher and degrade his victims. She could even block out the mental image of those insane wild eyes looking out through the moist holes in Kemper's face. But she couldn't deal with the fucking chainsaw. Every time that bastard engine roared in her face, the whole livid nightmare of her situation come falling back in on her, until she was almost buried beneath the rubble of paralyzing fear. Each time she heard the chainsaw accelerate, it cut another chunk of sanity out of her soul. So all she could do was run. No plan, no thought, just run. Away from the noise, away from the chainsaw, away. Though it was dark now, she bolted straight off the road and into the dense tangle of the grove. If she stayed on the dirt track, he'd have no trouble finding her in the moonlight. But maybe through the undergrowth she could find some place to hide. Or maybe she could keep running until he gave up and stopped coming after her. The chainsaw kept pace behind her, revving, calling for her. <laughs> Warning her as it was dragged left to right to left in an unpredictable twitching zigzag. And suddenly, Aaron knew how a hunted deer felt. She was running through the woods, fighting her way through gnarled tree limbs and thorny sticker bushes, fleeing from a relentless hunter who seemed to think it was a bloody game. Once, 
Twice, she almost fell over, her foot caught by something in the vegetation, but she pushed on. Her bare arms were becoming scratched and her fingers were still sore and bleeding from her struggle with the wheel nuts, but she ignored them. Real pain was what Pepper, Andy, and Kemper had experienced. These pathetic nicks and bumps were nothing, nothing at all. The machine was built for cutting timber. It scythed the straight path through the grove towards her, oblivious to the broken teeth and punctured eyeballs cut up in the links of the chain. She was going to die. Die, bitch, die. Aaron could hear him grunting and firing the chainsaw. <laughs> his heavy tread falling like imperfect death close behind her. Most of the time, she was able to run flat out, sprinting awkwardly in her cumbersome platforms. But then she would come to a ditch or an almost impenetrable thicket, where all she could do was throw herself forward and hope for the best. Her hair, clothes, and skin were all dirty and in disarray. With her cuts, bruises, and scrapes, and with her panic-stricken eyes, she broke through the forest like the victim of a car wreck which wasn't too far from the truth. That bastard had taken the van apart. He destroyed both the A100 and its owner. And there was some deeply sick irony to the fact that when Kemper's features had last looked upon his customized pride and joy, they had done so in the form of a death mask. Who's the daddy now? Rushing forward over a hurdle of fallen branches, Aaron half climbed her way out through the edge of the grove into a clearing. She didn't know if this was a good or a bad thing. On the one hand, she could move more quickly, but on the other, he would know exactly where she was. And she could hear him now, the sputtering of the chainsaw calling her name. If she lay down and surrendered to the bastard, her troubles would all be over. She could just give in to him let him do what he wanted with her. She couldn't stop it. No. What the hell was she thinking? Aaron picked herself up and ran out into the clearing. It was then that she saw she had entered an old neglected trailer park. Well, it was a trailer park once. Now it was mostly a flat, empty space of dirt, except for the trailer. Over across the other side of the clearing, a lone surviving trailer squatted beneath a knot of swaying trees. The trailer looked worse for wear, but there were lights on inside. She could see them through the closed drapes. There was also a lamp tied up on one of the abutting trees, throwing a pull of brilliance against the outside of the trailer door. Aaron took one last terrified look over her shoulder, then headed straight for the mobile home, both her legs and feet aching. Surely she could find one person in this town who was halfway goddamn normal. They couldn't all be mentally unstable morons, Frankly, Aaron didn't give a damn who was inside this trailer as long as she could find a phone and a decent weapon. Chances are the owner kept a handgun, maybe even a rifle. As she drew closer to the trailer, Aaron could see it was standing in the middle of a veritable lake of discarded propane tanks, oil drums, crates, tables, and other typical trailer park junk. It looked like whoever lived there had been doing so for some time. They'd be dead in an hour if they didn't help her. Aaron had no doubt that the killer would come for them. He didn't seem to care who he murdered or how many people he had to slaughter his way through. He wasn't worried about being seen, caught, stopped, or anything. He kept steaming forward, chopping down anyone who got in his way. If the killer found Aaron here, he'd trash the trailer the same way he'd torn open the van. Leatherface would come at it with the chainsaw until it was all done. Clearly, she'd got a head start on the freak because he was still cutting his way through the wood while she was almost at the trailer. Gasping, weeping, crippled with fear, Aaron ran up to the trailer door and banged on it with both hands. She was out of breath, but her hammering was furious and unmistakable. Tears ran down her dirty face, but she kept on knocking as she sank slowly to her knees on the portable steps leading up to the cabin entrance. The chainsaw was looming nearer, but she was exhausted, and the sudden pause in her urgent flight had paved the way for shock to set in and her mind to shut down. Suddenly, the trailer door was pulled open, and two massive arms seized hold of Aaron. 
dragging the young woman to her feet. Aaron screamed and tried to fight, but the hands were too strong. Before Aaron knew it, she'd been hauled inside the trailer. Back up at the Hewitt house, blind screaming madness was in the air. Andy, Kemper, Morgan, they were all there locked inside and broken into tiny pieces. They'd been restrained, held against their will, smothered by the raw flesh of dying meat and ridiculed. Upstairs, downstairs, the basement, all the rooms echoed with laughter, anger, rage, humiliation, and excitement slicing through the foundations of the house like a razor, constantly defying meaning, destroying fellowship and turning the three little bastards from the van into meat puppets. As soon as Leatherface brought those two bitches home, the whole family could settle down for the evening. Then they could really have some fun. There were bloodstains on the white sheets hung to dry outside. Footsteps thundered on the floorboards of the house slamming the doors and shouting in deep Texan voices. Blood on white sheets. Blind, screaming madness. Aaron was kicking and punching. She thought she'd fought free of the hands, when in reality, and unbeknownst to her, they'd simply let her go. The woman who'd helped Aaron into the trailer was in her 40s, and she was huge. She wore a basic sleeveless dress that hung over her elephantine frame like a floral sack. Although her brown wavy hair was long and thick, it sat like a bad toupee on top of her enormous head. Her jowls so fat that her chin seemed to run straight down to her breast with no gap in between. However, despite her considerable weight, the woman did take pride in her appearance. The makeup she wore was fetching and well applied, and her glasses were those feminizing cat's eye frames that had been so fashionable ten years ago. Nevertheless, the cramped conditions of the trailer made the woman seem like the proverbial ship inside a bottle. Suddenly, Erin started to scream. She knew what would happen if they didn't hurry up and do something. But how could she explain herself? There was no time to talk. But how do you begin to convince someone that there's a psycho out there with a chainsaw and a mask made from her boyfriend's face? How? How? With each passing second, he was getting closer. Her whole body was shaking. Random words and whimpers began to spill out of her mouth. Where was he? Erin ran over to the nearest window and peered through the drapes, but she could only see her own reflection. It was too dark outside. She raised her hands and cupped them over her eyes and forehead to block out the reflection, but she couldn't see. Quickly, she tried another window and another, and as she did so, the trailer owner studied Aaron with wry amusement. "'Why don't you have a seat?' she said, pointing to an old armchair. "'I'm Henrietta.' Abruptly, Aaron stopped and looked at her, at the woman, as if noticing her for the first time. Likewise, the trailer." It looked cozy enough, but it was full of clutter. A lot of it tasteless, like the plaster figurine of a classical female nude over on the shelf. The woman also had a lot of photographs, all in frames. Some of the pictures were up on the walls, some were standing on a small table, and there were a few on the shelves. The pictures were in cheap frames, but they domesticated the place all the same. Henrietta also had a couple of vases, and a clock, and... Some ornamental glassware, nothing fancy, mind. And she... The door was open. Aaron ran over, slammed the door shut, and locked it. Then she grabbed hold of the armchair Henrietta had offered her and jammed it up against the aluminum door handle. She didn't know if the lock or the chair would hold, but she would try anything to keep him out. Again, she pressed her face close to one of the windows and looked out. Please help me. She begged quietly, finally in control of her voice. (laughs) 
The whistling sound came out of the blue, filling the trailer with shrill, piercing insistence. Aaron screamed before realizing it was just the whistle of a kettle. Turn that thing off! She shouted. He'll hear us! Henrietta had no idea who the girl meant, but she hurried off into the tiny kitchenette at the end of the trailer and turned off the gas. Almost immediately, the steam whistle died down and faded into silence. When Henrietta returned, she found Aaron pacing the floor and continuously glancing rapid fire in all directions, looking at all the windows, the door, waiting, listening, and watching. The big woman didn't seem to know what any of this was about. Aaron hadn't introduced or explained herself, but she was clearly in some distress, and Henrietta knew how to fix that. She left the girl to chew the carpet and went back into the kitchenette. Aaron could hear Henrietta moving about doing something. There was clattering, cutlery, crockery, something moving on a tabletop. Aaron wanted the woman to shut up so that she could concentrate on listening to what was going on outside. Any moment now, and the two of them would be under siege. A few seconds later, and the big woman returned. Nothing that a good old cup of tea won't be able to settle, she said in smooth tones, shot through with Travis County charm. She had a cup of tea in her hand and held it towards Aaron, but the girl didn't even notice it. Just the same, Henrietta held on to the cup as she dropped her massive girth down into the armchair Aaron had placed up against the locked door. The armchair groaned under her weight and pressed even further back. So there, Henrietta soothed. Nobody is coming through here now. Aaron knew what she meant. The woman was trying to calm her down, and under normal circumstances, the weight of her ample body would have stopped anyone from opening that door. But what the hell would the woman do when she got a chainsaw stuck up her big fat ass? No, Henrietta was reassuring no one, least of all, Aaron. The girl took another look around the dingy trailer. I, I need your phone. Henrietta stirred the tea and grimaced. Don't have one, she declared. Nothing but hassles is what they are. Aaron slammed her fist down on the table. Don't you get it? She cried. He'll kill us. He'll kill us both. Henrietta shook her head. No, he won't. He knows better than to mess around here. Believe me. No, he won't. He knows better than to mess around here. Believe me. It took Aaron a few seconds to understand what she'd just heard. She couldn't believe it at first. What the woman seemed to be saying. It was yet another twist of the knife. You know him? Asked Aaron. Everyone round here knows that poor sweet boy. The earth fell away beneath Aaron's feet as she felt herself losing her grip on her mind. This was too much for her. The trailer, Henrietta. It was almost crazy. The matter-of-fact way she talked about... Were they talking about the same person? Poor... Sweet... What? After all the screaming and the running, after all the violence and the chainsaw, this moment of pretend calm, this homely display of madness, what chance did Aaron have anymore? What hope? Was she the lunatic and everyone else was sane? Henrietta smiled dismissively. Oh, he just looks, well, different. After everything that happened... What was she saying? What the fuck was she saying? Different? Aaron slumped to the floor in front of the armchair. There was no one to talk to, nowhere to run, no one who could help her, nowhere to hide, no hope. She pulled her knees up under her chin and sat there, her eyes fixed on the windows, waiting for the poor sweet boy to come in and stuff her body senseless with his chainsaw. It was over. It was all over. She was mentally and physically exhausted. No matter what she did, no matter where she ran, she ended up right back at square fucking one. Shoots and fucking ladders, and the last one to the top gets butchered. Henrietta carried on talking, almost to herself, oblivious to the sight of the light fading from Aaron's eyes. There's no harm, she gabbled. He always keeps to himself. Skin cancer, real shame. He was so young when it started up, poor thing. Didn't you look at his face? Aaron's jaw sagged open. 
Her own face was fast becoming expressionless. I, I couldn't, she replied. The last time Aaron had seen the poor thing's face, he'd looked just like her boyfriend. Henrietta mulled this over. Of course the girl hadn't seen his face. He always wore a mask, didn't he? Well, not always, but certainly since he was a boy. Henrietta remembered only too clearly the day the family first made Thomas hide his face. It was only natural because the boy was so pig ugly. The cancer had messed him up so bad, no one could stand to look at him. And the doctor said his face rot couldn't be fixed. Called it genetic like it was something to do with Adolf Schittkreist Hitler or something. So his pa made him wear a bag over his head. If he didn't, he got a damn good beating. Of course, the boy had no friends, didn't go to school none. The only fun he ever had was when Pa got gone and took him down the slaughterhouse to play with all the animals. Well, they didn't know ugly from shit. He used to bring bits of them home, and he made stuff with them. His first real mask was made from a pig's head, and it was so funny his Pa nearly shit himself, but old Monty Hewitt was like that. He had a good old sense of humor, and the stupid little pig boy just broke him up. It was Monty who got Thomas that job at the meat packing place. That was before it was uh, modernized and they both got fired. And it was about that time that young Thomas took to wearing human skin. It was heroic. He had clutched triumph out of adversity using other people's faces to fix his own. And he could look like whomever he wanted without spending millions of dollars on that darn plastic surgery. He tried wearing someone's face to work once but got into all kinds of trouble. That was around the time old Monty lost his legs, got into a fight with the boy, and Thomas whooped his ass, took the old bastard's legs off with a cleaver. Monty was damn proud that day. All through his son's life, Mr. Montague Hewitt had worked hard to make sure his ugly little shit grew up to be a man. It was important for their economy. The Hewitts had worked in meat for generations, and there was no reason to stop just because they'd been thrown out of the slaughterhouse by some pencil-necked prick. They had a living to make, but old Monty couldn't go on killing passerby forever. He was getting too old. He needed his son to take over. And that's why Monty was so worried that the skin trouble might have turned his son into a freak boy or some kind of skin care faggot. It was only when the boy spat in the old man's face and took away his legs that Monty knew his son would grow up just fine. Thomas was going to be just like his pa. Now, Thomas was practically head of the household. Sure, Ma and Pa were still fighting and a-cussing all the time and saying what's that and what's what, and they didn't think twice about coming at Thomas with a knife or something. But the boy was the heart and soul of the place, no doubt about it. They'd all be up Shit's Creek if it weren't for Thomas. Henrietta got out of the armchair and reached a hand down to Aaron's forehead, not to check the girl's temperature, but to gently yet firmly hold the girl's head in place, and the woman still held the teacup in her other hand. Aaron didn't respond. She was too far gone, unable to think her way through this never-ending escalation of horror. She didn't want to know anymore. She didn't give a damn. Henrietta looked down at the steaming cup of tea. "'Just right,' she said." Then she raised the brim up to Aaron's lips, coaxing the girl to take a sip. Aaron did so, finding the tea both strong and sweet. Then she took another sip and another. Slowly, Henrietta passed the cup over into the girl's hands, then stood and watched over her. Aaron lifted the cup and tried to drink, but she was shaking so bad that she was in danger of pouring the tea all over the floor. Some of the brew had already spilled down the side of the cup. Drink up before it gets cold, urged Henrietta. In all truth, Erin didn't realize just how thirsty she'd become, and the hot, soothing tea was actually doing something to raise her spirits again. All the same, she was in no rush to swallow anything Henrietta had given her. Erin didn't know just how involved the woman was in all of this. 
but at least she was beginning to understand why that maniac still hadn't broken in through the trailer door. Henrietta saw the girl's hesitation. Come now, she said. You must be awful thirsty. I promise it'll make you feel better. Erin brought the cup right up to her mouth and gulped. Then she lowered the drink and wiped her lips with the back of her hand. You have no idea, she began falteringly. Now, honey, the woman cut in, sitting back down in her armchair. I know that you've had quite a shock. Hush now. Henrietta seemed about to smother Erin in a wave of reassuring platitudes, when suddenly a voice cried out from the next room. Erin was shocked to hear it. it was the voice of a crying baby. Now see what you've done, chided Henrietta. Quickly she got up out of the chair again and bustled along back into the kitchenette area. A stack of unwashed dishes was cluttering up the sink and the small plastic trash can in the corner was over full, spilling garbage onto the floor. Henrietta opened the refrigerator. My, oh my, oh my, she chimed, hearing the baby's hungry little cries. She'd be with him in a moment. First, she had to prepare some scrumptious baby food. The shelves of the refrigerator were filled mostly with the rotting leftovers of previously unfinished meals. While the few unopened provisions were mainly processed in convenience food, Henrietta looked up at the top shelf where eight cans of baked beans stood neatly in two columns of three and one column of two. She took one of the cans off the shelf and then closed the fridge door. Next, she tried to find a can opener. It wasn't easy hunting one down in all the clutter and dirty dishes. She kept meaning to buy one of those new ones you stick on the wall. That way, she wouldn't keep losing it. Maybe Leatherface could keep an eye out for one. Folk pack the strangest things on journeys these days. Henrietta couldn't remember who first called Thomas Leatherface. She couldn't remember when, either. She only knew he didn't particularly care much for it. Hurrying herself along, she looked through into the adjacent room where Aaron was still holding the teacup in both hands. Drink up, she called. It'll help you relax. Then she continued her search for a can opener, eventually finding one underneath the pages of an old newspaper. Humming cheerily to herself and all too aware of the crying baby, Henrietta expertly opened the can and tossed the lid aside. The serrated circle of galvanized tin fell to the floor where it was sucked to a dead stop by the underside layer of cold tomato sauce. Now she needed something to feed the baby with. She put the can opener down on top of the portable TV, where she'd remember it, and went searching for a spoon. She found one in the sink. Other than a bit of old cat food, it was meticulously clean. Can and spoon at the ready, Henrietta flounced her big body back to where Aaron was sitting on the floor. There, she opened a thin clipboard door that led to an adjacent room, probably the bedroom. I'll be right back, she announced cheerily. Then she went on through and closed the door behind her. Aaron was still having trouble making sense of all this. It was the calm after the storm. He chased her all the way here only to do nothing. Was he out there? Was he sitting outside waiting for her to come out? Was the crazy fat bitch telling her the truth when she said she was safe here? And just who was Henrietta? It was insane the way the woman just went about her business, making cups of tea, chatting merrily as if Aaron was a house guest on a perfectly normal day. That's not how this thing was going. That's not how any of this was meant to play out. Aaron was supposed to have been screaming for help. Henrietta should have panicked and that goddamn freaking psychopath should have broken in and killed them both. Or scared them off so that they could run away and meet who? Another lunatic? Whatever the answer, Aaron had to admit she was grateful for the break. Okay, she was probably still in deep shit. Okay, they were probably still going to try to kill her. But at least just for now, if only for a moment, she could collect her thoughts and catch her breath. And if it all turned out to be some big game, some sadistic joke at her expense, and they killed her the moment she walked out the door, what the hell could she do about it? On the positive side, if they really were as crazy as she thought, Aaron might just be able to play them off against one another, or, maybe, slip through this disjointed cracks of their net. She just had to stay sharp, keep her wits about her, and wait for the right moment. Hard to believe that only a few moments ago Aaron was almost ready to give up. 
Yet now, if anything, she seemed strangely calm, almost relaxed, almost too relaxed. She began to get up off the floor, but sat straight back down again. She got up too quickly and became dizzy. Slowly, carefully, she tried again and had another dizzy spell. Only this time, she rode it out and stayed up on her feet. But there was definitely something wrong. Her head felt very groggy, and the room was turning. Was it just tiredness, or had Henrietta... Aaron looked at the teacup in her hands. It was still three-quarters full. She felt her brow seemed okay, just a little damp. But she had to concentrate as she walked step by uncertain step into the untidy kitchen area with its permanent odor of bacon grease. The door to the bedroom was still closed, so Aaron was completely alone as she staggered awkwardly over to the sink and poured the rest of her tea away. The brew cascaded down a stack of dirty plates like the water in a Venetian fountain before trickling off down the drain. She turned and looked around the room. It was small, very small, and the electric lamps didn't seem to be making much difference when it came to brightening things. But then kitchens were meant to be functional, not warm and snug. Kitchens were where meals were made, where millions of dismembered animal corpses were cut up and cooked, each and every hour of the day. Some framed photos stood propped against the wall on the small kitchen table. Aaron bent down to take a closer look at them. There were three of them, family photos taken a long time ago. One showed Henrietta posing for the camera with a little boy in front of a Christmas tree. The boy couldn't have been more than four years old. Aaron couldn't tell when the picture was taken, but Henrietta looked a lot younger, if just as fat as she was now. The woman's dress sense hadn't changed much either. A second photo was of the boy on his own. He was a few years older than in the Christmas scene, and he was sitting on a wooden rocking horse. Aaron frowned. The boy had purple blotches all over the skin of his face. Finally, the third photo. Jesus. Aaron stood up and recoiled in shock. Her stomach was in her mouth and her head was spinning again. The photo. Henrietta was hugging the same boy, only he was a teenager, and his face... Aaron had stood up too fast. The whole room was spinning, alive with the grotesque disfigurement of the teenager's face, preserved for all time by the photographer's lens. The image had caught Aaron so totally by surprise that she felt as if she'd been punched straight in the gut. He looked so awful, ugly, so horribly deformed. The lovely smile of the Christmas kid destroyed by facial sickness. She grabbed hold of her head to stop the dizziness and prepared to steal her nerves for another look at the photo, when she was startled by the sudden ringing of the phone. The phone? Aaron spun on her heels and lurched drunkenly back into the living room. It was a phone. She definitely heard a phone. The door leading out of the trailer was still locked, the armchair firmly up against it. But Aaron wasn't interested at all in leaving right now. Instead, she walked across to the closed door opposite the exit, the door that Henrietta had disappeared into. Aaron pressed her muggy head up against the veneered clipboard and listened through. She could hear Henrietta's muffled voice. No doubt about it, Henrietta was talking to someone and it wasn't the baby. Aaron pushed the door open and burst into the bedroom. She was feeling increasingly shaky on her feet, but she still had enough sense to see that Henrietta was speaking into a goddamn phone. The obese trailer trash was sitting on the bed. She had a baby girl on her knees and a cigarette in her fucking mouth. As she held the phone in the crook of her neck, she spoon-fed the baby a messy mouthful of cold baked beans, straight from the can. Henrietta looked up and saw the anger and confusion on Aaron's ghostly white face. I better go now, she said to whoever was on the other end of the line, and then she hung up. Aaron stared at the baby. The tiny girl was adorable, blonde hair, smooth white skin, and the most perfect face. The sight of her bouncing up and down in her soft rabbit pajamas sent powerful waves of emotion sweeping through Aaron's body. The child's innocence and playfulness were completely out of place. They seemed so wrong here, and there was something else. You okay? asked Henrietta, glowing with motherly pride. You don't look so good. 
Suddenly, Aaron remembered why she charged in here. She motioned to the phone. I thought... You said... You didn't have one. Henrietta sniffed, blew one last puff of smoke into the baby's face, and stubbed the cigarette out in an overflowing ashtray lying on the bed. But she said nothing, and the phone was plain to see. It was there, right beside her on the bed stand. What's going on? Aaron demanded, but suddenly she was feeling very weak and her legs started to buckle beneath her. She stopped, putting a foot behind her to try and prevent her knees from giving way. Why don't you come here and lie down, said Henrietta, patting a space on the bed cover, before you faint dead away. Aaron gripped the side of the open doorway. She could barely stand upright. What the hell was happening to her? Where was this guy with the chainsaw? Why hadn't he attacked her yet? Oh, the photos! Her head was spinning. Henrietta was with him in the photos. That was him, the maniac as a child. No, no, not those photos. Her memory struggled to tell her something, something important. The other photos, the baby, the baby right here in the trailer, not the baby in the Christmas photo, the baby in the Polaroid, the baby in the Polaroid. Suddenly it was clear. That's what had been nigging and nagging her about the baby. She'd seen it before. Henrietta's baby was wearing the same pajamas as the baby in the Polaroid they'd found at the automobile graveyard. Morgan had picked up that jar from inside the smashed-up Californian station wagon, and he'd found two Polaroids suspended in amber fluid. One of the pictures was a portrait of the girl who'd shot herself, but the other was a picture of the dead girl's family. The baby in the family photo and the baby here in the trailer were one and the goddamn same which meant Henrietta's baby was the suicide girl's younger sister. Jesus Christ! Aaron fought hard to remember everything she saw on that Polaroid. She had to understand. There was more. There were the parents, the teenage girl, the baby, and someone else. Yes, there was a young boy and he wore a Felix the Cat t-shirt. Just like... Oh my God, just like Jedediah. The family! The whole fucking family! Aaron began to cry, her tears an uncontrollable expression of sorrow fused with anger. Just as her own day had been an unbelievable string of terrifying events, another story now started to unfold within her mind, a story about a family heading for California who took a wrong turn in Travis County, Texas, a story about a mother and father savagely murdered and about their daughter, driven insane with fear but able to escape her captors before taking her own life with the revolver. A story about their eldest son, stranded in the wilderness, surviving as best he could in a decrepit abandoned mill, adapting to whatever fate threw at him. And a story about their youngest daughter, a baby fostered by a lying fat maniac bitch, a baby who would never know her real family. The whole damn bastard story was becoming clear to Aaron, and with it came one final unbearable revelation. Jedediah's constant fascination with the dead teenage girl. It wasn't morbid curiosity. She was his sister. They'd driven up there to Crawford Mill with her dead body in the back, and... Oh no. The teenage girl had panicked because she'd seen that sign by the side of the road. Drive slow. See our city. Drive fast, see our sheriff. She'd panicked because she'd seen the sign before, and she knew where it would take them. So she'd run forward and try to force Kemper to turn around, but Andy had overpowered her, and Aaron had tried to calm her down, and that's why she'd killed herself. Because they'd ignored her. They didn't listen to what she'd tried to tell them. So she blew her own brains out rather than risk being caught by that face-cutting freak again. Aaron could still hear that gunshot. They'd killed the girl. They'd ignored her. But maybe, please God, maybe, there was a way Aaron could undo some of the harm. That poor little baby could not be allowed to grow up among these crazy bastards. Still holding onto the doorframe, Aaron lifted her head and glared at Henrietta. That is not your child! Fear spat across Henrietta's piggish eyes, the bright eye shadow doing nothing to lift them from the bulbous wall fat that was her face. 
She's mine! She shouted, clutching the baby tight to her breast. The can of beans fell to the floor, spilling onto the carpet. You stole her! Screamed Erin. She took a step forward and reached out to snatch the baby. When everything suddenly moved, the floor tilted and rocked beneath her feet, while the walls of the trailer rippled and revolved, expanding out of all proportion. Aaron fell to the floor as the drug took hold. She looked up. Henrietta had relaxed her grip on the baby, but was still carrying the little girl as she stared down at Aaron sprawled across the bedroom floor. Everything's gonna be fine real soon, said Henrietta sweetly. I promise. Then she lifted her flabby round head out of the way, unblocking a view up to the skylight. Though there was a bright lamp in the bedroom, Erin could see up through the clear hatch, right up to the stars. And now she knew she'd been drugged, because the stars all seemed to be moving. A moment later and Erin was fast asleep, knocked out cold. But the stars continued moving. Outside, the trailer had been hitched up to a truck, and the whole damn thing was on the move, rolling and bumping along the unpaved moonlight trail. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 12 of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake by Stephen Hand. Once again, great job to uh, Bonanza Jellybean voicing Aaron. You're doing a great job. Thank you so much, and thank you for being a patron of the channel. Uh, this book is really getting good. We're in the last third of the book now. And, uh, you know, I thought this was a really good chapter. We got a little more detail on the whole Henrietta scene. Uh, we got a really good chase there. Um, we got confirmation about what exactly happened to Pepper, good lord. And we got a little backstory on Leatherface from Henrietta's memory. I thought that was really cool. Uh, the only thing I don't understand is Jedediah seemed like... Are they saying he's been living out there for a while and he was part of that family? You know, living on his own? Because, I mean, that girl didn't seem like she'd been living out there with him and got away. It seemed like she had just got away. So, can someone explain that to me? I always thought Jedediah was just part of the crazy Hewitt family or something. I don't know. It, that part confused me a little bit here in the book because he didn't seem like he'd been living out there that long. In the movie, you know, it, it, let me rephrase that. In the movie, in the way he's explained in the book, it seems like he'd been out there for a really long time but the girl had just escaped when they picked her up, so he couldn't have been out there too long, right? I don't know. Let me know what you guys thought of the chapter. I'll be back very soon with more of this book. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying thanks for listening. Be excellent to each other. <laughs>